Ben Eder has a brilliant YouTube series on building the simplest possible one, or SAP One computer. This was originally designed by Albert Paul Malvino in his book Digital Computer Electronics. Ben did a deep dive into the design, going into more detail than in the book, and he added some extra instructions such as conditional and unconditional branching. His breadboard video series inspired many to build the machine with considerable design expansions. And I think Michael Kamprath's Beauty One has probably taken this to the extreme. But I wanted to go down a different pathway. Rather than expanding the design, I wanted to see if I could make it even simpler. This machine is instruction set compatible with Ben Eder's modified SAP One, but it uses less than half the number of chips. Here you can see it running the Fibonacci sequence, and this is the exact code that Ben Eder used in his video series. In fact, I copied it directly from one of his videos. His final design uses a number of 7400 series logic chips, and according to the bill of materials on his website, the final tally comes to 49 chips. I'm going to call this build the Turing SAP1, mainly in keeping with the other videos on the channel, and it uses a total of 17 chips. But if I take away the clock circuitry and the display, the total actually comes down to 11. Obviously, Ben Eddy could remove these chips as well. The reduced chip count does come at a cost though, and that cost is EEPROM size. Ben Eddy used a pair of 28C16E squared PROMs, arranged as 2K by 16 bits. For this build, I've used the rather large 27C322E PROM, which is arranged as 2 meg by 16 bits. Although I'm only currently using 512K out of that 2 meg, and I think with some trickery I could get it down to 32K, but I'll discuss that later in the video series. So why the larger EEPROM? I think the short answer is that some of the functionality that Ben Ada has in hardware, I'm doing in software. Looking at the RAM, I think everyone uses static RAM unless they're forced to use dynamic RAM. The SAP1 uses some 74LS189s, and together this only provides 16 bytes of memory. By contrast, I'm using a 628128 static RAM, which contains 128 kilobytes, but at the moment I'm only using 23 of those bytes. What are some of the advantages of using the architecture outlined in this video series? First, larger EEPROMs are no more expensive than smaller EEPROMs, and it's still a trivial amount of memory compared to today's SD cards. It's pretty easy to make the machine ISA compatible with another CPU. This can be extremely difficult when everything's hardwired. The hardware builds a lot simpler, and it's almost on par with a CPU-based system. A 42-pin EEPROM is about the same wiring complexity as a 40-pin CPU. Another thing that I think is an advantage is that you have complete control of the system. There's no complex abstract layer between you and the silicon. For example, an FPGA still requires a compiler. You don't really know what's going on at each combinatorial logic block, and you're not exposed to the low-level architecture of the FPGA. But the most important reason is that I think this type of architecture is a good bridge between computer architecture and theoretical computer science. To be completely honest, I found theoretical computer science completely boring the first time I learned it, and I had to force myself, but I found it a lot more interesting when I could see how it related to the architecture of the machines we used. Here's an overview of the SAP1 architecture as described in Paul Albert Molvino's book. It's centered around this 8-bit W bus in the middle of the design. There are some hardware features I can get rid of and still execute code compatible with this machine. First, I don't really need a hardware program counter. It also turns out that I don't need hardware for the accumulator, B register, or ALU. You might be thinking, you can't do that, they're my favorite bits. Now, I understand this may be antithetical to what you already know about computer architecture, which is why I'd recommend you stay around and find out how I've done this. I did need to make some modifications to the remaining architecture. I've increased the size of the RAM from 16 bytes to 23. I've connected the controller directly up to the W bus. I've turned what was the instruction register and micro instruction counter into a state register, which is now 10 bits wide. I've modified the memory address register module and added a 4-bit pathway from the controller. And finally, 
I've added a 10-bit pathway from the controller to the state register, and that turns this into a finite state machine. This is another way of looking at the architecture. It has the finite state machine on the left, while on the right, there's a couple of registers and a random access memory. The W bus runs along the bottom here. Before we start the build, I just want to say that I think it's phenomenal that all this information is available on the internet, and in particular on YouTube. I'm presenting my take on the material here, but I would encourage you to go and have a look at some of the other content creators. That is, after you finish this video series. Which reminds me, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It really helps the channel. This lets more people be exposed to the material, particularly those who like hands-on learning compared to being stuck in a university lecture hall. And while we're on the topic of hands-on learning, I'll make the source code for the emulator and the SAP1 ROM generator available at the end of the series. You may be able to use it as the basis for a CPU with a more complex instruction set. And how cool would it be to be able to play games from that famous 8-bit era? It was really these games that got me interested in computers in the first place. Then I became more interested in the machine than the games. Unfortunately, I don't think the SAP one's up to the task for any of these. Back to the build. With very few exceptions, computers run on a clock. This is just a regular signal that goes between 0 and 5 volts, then back down to 0. It does this at a regular interval, and we prefer it to be a square wave, so we like these edges to be as sharp as possible. The clock I'm using in this machine is simpler than Ben Eater's clock, so I do save a couple of chips there. But I'm just using the 555 timer like he does, and this is a pretty common circuit that should give me about 1 to 10 hertz. I'm going to build a triple five timer on my breadboard. I'm trying out these transparent breadboards to see how much I like them. One of the things you'll notice here are the red and black power lines running from top to bottom. And I've actually soldered these to connectors which plug into the breadboard. Distributing power on breadboard builds can be extremely difficult. Let's hook up a logic probe. The output pin is pin 3, and that appears to be working. I was able to time it with the video stamps, and that's about 4 hertz. I want to use this raw clock signal during the build process, so I'm going to distribute it with this yellow wire. Eventually, I'll need a more sophisticated clock circuit, but I'm just going to put these down for now to allow me to test the system as I build it. For now, I'm going to connect all of the input clocks to all the octal D-type flip-flops up to the one single source. The reason for doing this will become apparent pretty soon, but I think it'll help me spot errors as I make them rather than later on during the bring-up. The first two chips on the bill of materials are EEPROMs, which are also known as erasable, programmable, read-only memories. I have discussed these at length in other videos, but I'm going to go over the basics again here. You may want to skip this if you've seen it before. The first EEPROM is the 74C322, which is a 32 megabit EEPROM. It's arranged as 2 meg by 16 bits. On the right, we can see the functional diagram. It has power and ground. It has 21 input address lines and 16 output lines. The G line I'll drive low, but E I actually use for reset. This is the chip here. It's 42 pins and it comes in a 600mm wide package. The through hole leads make it suitable for a breadboard design, and this is the largest through hole EEPROM I've been able to find. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find an electrically erasable through hole equivalent. This is a pretty typical computer memory. We can think of it abstractly as being like this set of pigeonholes full of different coloured ducks, where the information is carried by the colour of the duck. Now to be useful, we need to number all of the pigeonholes, and in computer science we start at zero. These pigeonholes are a metaphor for what's actually going on inside the chip. This is the other EEPROM I've used in the build, the 27C4001. It only stores half a megabyte of information and has 32 pins instead of 42. It's arranged as 512K by one byte, and apart from the size and the number of output pins, these chips are very similar. So for this description part of the video, I'll use them interchangeably a bit. A limitation of this type of memory 
is that from the outside we can only access one pigeonhole at a time. The EEPROMs have a number of address pins, which you can think of as being the pigeonhole number. Then either 8 or 16 output pins, which tells us the duck colour. These chips are actually pretty easy to use. We just send in an address in binary into the address pins, and out comes the duck colour in binary as well. There is a slight delay in this process. It takes about 100 nanoseconds from presenting the address to getting the data. The main EEPROM I use for computation in this build is the 27C322. Here I've laid down the chip in KiCad, and I'll make this schematic available below. For the first part of the build, I don't actually need the upper address pins, so I'll just use a resistor network to tie them low. For some of the other address lines, I'll just tie them directly to ground. I will need them a bit later on though. The next major chip that I want to look at is the 74HC574, and I actually use seven of them in this build, so I think it's pretty important that I go over them. This chip contains eight D-type flip-flops. They're all connected to a common clock, which are triggered on the positive edge, and they're also connected to a common output enable signal. When this signal is high, the outputs are actually disconnected from the pins. It comes in a 20-pin dip package, which makes it ideal for breadboard builds. It's actually very similar to the 74HC374, but the pin layout's much more sensible with all the inputs on one side and all the outputs on the other. We can think of this chip as being a bit like a single pigeonhole that stores one piece of 8-bit information. When output enables low, the value stored in the D-type flip-flops is reflected on the output wires. When clocks either high or low, it doesn't really matter what's presented at the input. The stored value stays the same. On the positive edge of clock, though, the value presented on the input wires gets stored and is presented on the output wires. Let's have a look at that again and keep your eye on the clock signal in the lower left. And once more for good value. Now let's remember that duck color is just data, and it's actually represented as a binary number. Here's where we really get into the meat of how this machine works. What I'm about to show you is one of the most important circuits in computer architecture, and we can make it with an EEPROM and a set of D-type flip-flops. The output from the EEPROM goes into the inputs of the D-type flip-flops, and drum roll, The output from the D-type flip-flops goes back to some of the address lines on the EEPROM. The thick blue line is a bus, and it's just a convenient way of representing a number of wires that run in parallel. Normally, the EEPROM gives us the same output for any given input, but by using flip-flops which feed back into the address lines, we can represent a sequence of numbers. Here the zero goes back, we look up pigeonhole zero, see that it's red, which is equivalent to the number 2. We send this to the octal D-type flip-flop, and then 2 becomes the next number that we use in the sequence. The number 2 feeds back into the address lines of the EEPROM. We look up pigeonhole number 2, and see a light pink duck. This is equivalent to a 6. The 6 is output to the flip-flops and it gets stored. Then this feeds back in the next cycle, so hopefully from this you can see that we've made a circuit that will repeatedly go through the numbers 0, 2, 6, 3, 8, and back to 0. Once it reaches 0 again, the cycle repeats. This will keep happening provided there's power applied to the circuit, and there's a clock signal coming into the flip-flop. While I've used an EEPROM here, we can actually just use a combination of AND, OR, and inverter gates. This circuit's known as a finite state automata, and this simply means that because we have a fixed number of flip-flops, 8 in this case, we can only feed back a number between 0 and 255. The number fed back is known as the state, and because we have a fixed number of flip-flops, we have a finite number of states. This is where the terminology comes from. Try not to be too intimidated by the terminology, it's actually a pretty simple concept. Although I've drawn it this way in this circuit, it's important to note that not all the outputs need to feed back to all of the inputs. We can receive inputs from other parts of the circuit, and we can have outputs that don't directly feed back as an address. 
In this implementation of the SAP1, only 10 of the output wires feedback as inputs. These are the three chips I'm going to use to form my finite state automator. The clock circuit here on the left, the 27C322 EEPROM, and the 74HC574 octal D-type flip-flop. An octal means that there's eight individual flip-flops inside the chip. What I need to do is connect these eight outputs from the EEPROM up to the eight inputs to the 574. I'm going to form a bus to do this, and I need to uniquely label each connection. In this case, I'm going to call them D0 through D7, and one of the nice things about KiCad is I can just copy and paste these connections. I need to use these special 45 degree wire symbols. These tell KiCad that I'm forming a bus. And the bus itself is this thick blue wire. But really this is just a convenient way of connecting D0 to D0, D1 to D1 and so forth without having to draw all eight wires. Now that that's done, I need to connect the eight input address lines, which feed into the EEPROM, up to the eight output wires from the D-type flip-flops. I need a separate bus to do this, and I'm going to call this my A bus. I'm going to run this A bus next to the existing D bus, but it's important to remember that these buses are completely independent. One carries an address to the EEPROM, and the other carries data from the EEPROM. I'll just connect up these final wires. Don't worry if I'm going a little bit fast here for you. I'm going to make this schematic available on GitHub. The link will be provided below. That's eight of the 10 wires I need, and I'll worry about the other two a bit later. I've made a rather unfortunate mistake in the build. I've labeled all these chips 578, whereas it should be 574. And I've done this for multiple chips. I'll correct it later, but just be aware that some of the labeling's wrong at this stage. You might have also noticed that I've wired up some power and ground lines as well. Now I'm going to insert our large EEPROM. I'll use this jumper for the ground signals. I'll use this resistor network for the upper address pins. I want to connect the EEPROM data outputs to the flip-flop inputs. And conversely, I want to connect the flip-flop outputs to the address line inputs on the EEPROM. Normally I'd need to use lots of individual wires for this, but because it's going to happen in such a regular pattern and so often for this build, I've created this printed circuit board with two 8-bit headers, and one side's just wired up to the other side. This is a 3D model of what it'll look like. It has no active components, it's just a bunch of wires connecting one side to the other. I've had these manufactured, and now I just use them to connect up these buses. This is the D bus, and this resistor network's just a 100k pull down to ground for all the signals. It's used during reset when I disable the ROM and clock zero into the flip flops. I had another printed circuit board made up, which you can see here. The eight signals on the left are just directly connected to the eight signals on the right, one for one. Last one to make the circuit. I can tell with the logic probe that it's doing something, but what? I've hand soldered some LEDs to some perf board. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> Obviously, this isn't the finite state machine I'll use for the final SAP1, but the code to generate the Knight Rider pattern is pretty straightforward. I'll use it mainly to test the circuit. In state 1, output a 3, which becomes our next state. In state 3, output a 6, go to state 6. We do this all the way up to state 6, 0 in hex. Now we want to drop down to a single LED, which is state 4, 0. And now I need to do the reverse path. I'm going to use bit 7, which I don't display, to indicate that I'm coming backwards. I get down to state 83, which jumps back to 1 and repeats the whole cycle. That's the lower 8 output pins from the EEPROM. I wonder what the upper 8 pins are doing. Fortunately, I have even more LEDs soldered onto a perf board. <laughs> This is where the circuit's located in the final build. I said earlier that the SAP-1 wasn't up to the task of playing Apple II Pac-Man, 
let's just look at the dots. There are 248 dots, and we need one bit to say whether a dot's been eaten or not. So by my count, that's 31 bytes of storage that's required. The SAP-1 only has 16 bytes, and that's for the program as well. I want to go over the controller and the sequencer in a bit more detail. Although it's not completely obvious, Benita's design is also a finite state automata. The state variables and the logic that does the counting is all contained in the 74LS161. Most of the 16 control signals that run around the board, though, are generated from a lookup table based on the counter state and the current instruction being executed. It also uses a couple of flags the carry flag and the zero flag. With some effort, Benny was able to limit this to two 8 bit wide EPROMs. The finite state machine for this build is more complex than Ben Eder's. We need 28 bits coming out of the EEPROM rather than 16. There are two common ways to build a state machine. I've used the Moore model, and Ben Eder's used the Mealy model. You don't need to get too hung up on the details about this. Just know that they're basically the same sort of machine. I'm going to round up the 28 bits to 32 bits. So the simplest design really would be to use two 16-bit wide EEPROMs and have four octal D-type flip-flops capturing the output. I've used this approach in other builds, but it really is a pain trying to hook up all the address lines of two large EEPROMs on a breadboard. These EEPROMs actually have a lot more capacity than I need. This means I can squeeze it into a single EEPROM and just have a more complex clock signal. I latch one 16-bit value into a pair of 574s on the rising edge of clock 1, I transfer this to another pair of 574s on the rising edge of clock 2. At the same time, I read in another 16-bit value into a third pair of 574s. This means, on the positive edge of clock 2, I should get 32 bits out of these four 574s at once. The EEPROM also needs to be aware of clock 1. This is very similar to the circuit that I've used, but I've made two important changes. This register now clocks on clock 2 bar, so it latches on the negative edge of clock 2. The other main change is to the clock signal of this upper register. This will be in phase with clock 2 bar, but it will be gated by some other signals as well. These two registers on the right are the trickiest part of the design. I'll explain why I've done this in later videos, but for now, just accept that they have different clock phases. If we look at our Knight Rider circuit, what we've effectively done is connect up this lower octal D-type flip-flop to the output of the EEPROM, then provide a feedback path through the 574 back to the address lines of the same EEPROM. This forms the basis of our finite state machine. I've used 8 bits so far, and I'll add another 2 bits later. Now I want to connect up the second octal D-type flip-flop to the same 8 bits coming from the EEPROM. The difference is, these are latched on the rising edge of clock 1 rather than the rising edge of clock 2. I've added this 74HC574 to the design. I connect up these inputs to the same bus that I used before from the output of the EEPROM. That looks good. I'm going to use another one of these 8 pin to 8 pin printed circuit boards that I've had made up. I can tell you that this is so much easier than cutting, bending, and placing individual wires. In goes the 574. And we're off to the races. For now, while I'm using this Knight Rider pattern, I'm just going to use the same clock input for all the 574s. Because, well, for one, it looks pretty cool. But the main reason is really to try and find any mistakes. Next, I'm going to wire up the second 74HC574 in this pathway. As before, I add it to the schematic diagram. Then I connect up all the outputs of the 574 on the left to all of the inputs of the 574 on the right. For now, I'll just connect it up to clock raw, but eventually it gets connected up to clock 2 bar. For anyone who's watched any of my previous videos, you'll see how much quicker this is using these little jumper boards. I suspect they'll make a better electrical connection and they're mechanically more stable compared to individual wires but I am a little concerned that they may be spreading open the clasps inside the breadboard, so I'll try to avoid pulling them out and putting them back in too many times. 
I'm going to hook up an Octal D type flip flop to the upper 8 bits coming out of the EEPROM. This one's latched on the rising edge of clock 1, and it forms the connection between our controller and the W bus. Now, the W bus will have multiple devices on it, so this register will only be writing to the W bus part of the time. Here it is on the schematic diagram. I'll connect its inputs to the upper 8 bits coming out of the EEPROM. Don't worry if I'm scooting around this diagram a bit too fast. There's a link to a GitHub repository below. You should be able to find the full schematic there, and I recommend you take some time to really study it in detail. If I go over it any slower here, it'll be really boring, and I don't want to do that. I need to pull out this yellow set of LEDs and put a jumper board in its place. I've loosely chosen a colour scheme of red for data signals and blue for address signals. The common bus or the W bus I've made yellow. The right connection between the state machine and the W bus is through this 74HC574. I've connected the output enable to ground here, but that's just a temporary connection. Eventually this will be clock 2 bar. I'm going to connect up raw clock just so I can see the Knight Rider effect but eventually pin 11 of this chip will be connected to clock 1. This is the beginnings of the W bus on the schematic diagram. Eventually it'll have multiple connections. The W bus, which I'm going to hook up in yellow, is significantly different to Ben Eater's. He used leftover power connector strips and ran them up the middle of two sets of boards. This is one of the hallmarks of his design, and you can always spot it easily in a Ben Eater inspired build. I didn't want to use up the extra board space for this, and I wanted to see how far I could push the concept behind these plug in boards. You might notice the LEDs up the top are offset by one, so we can see the normally hidden bit 7 which tells us whether we're going backwards or forwards. You might notice that this upper jumper board is only 7 pins wide rather than 8, and I put in a physical wire for the 8th connection. It wasn't that I ran out of 8 pin boards, so if you want to hazard a guess, write it in the comments below. I'm going to wire in the memory address register, and don't forget, these two registers on the right here are quite complicated. So don't get too concerned if you don't really understand their function yet. It'll become clear over time. To relate it back to our original diagram, this is the register here that we're installing now. I've added it to the schematic, and now I just need to wire its inputs up to the W bus. Cut and paste these wires. Add the bus connector symbol to each one of them. And now just connect it to the existing W bus. While I'm here, I'll just connect up all the outputs from this register. These form the notepad address, but don't really worry about that for the moment. I'm going to use another one of these printed circuit board jumpers to connect up to the W bus. The connections can be a little bit tight sometimes, but eventually they always go in. Now for the jumper between the boards. That's good. I insert another 574, although as you can see it's labelled 578, but that's a mistake. Another jumper board. I'm going to need to move this LED board to test the new connection. It's a little tight coming out. Insert some blue LEDs and see how we go. That doesn't look like the Knight Rider pattern. No music for this one. Has anyone spotted the mistake? I inserted this chip off by one. That's better. Thankfully I didn't destroy the chip, but that's why I've used this Knight Rider pattern. It just makes it so much easier to spot errors. Back to our block diagram. The state machine also needs to receive input from the W bus, so I'm going to connect it here to the address lines on the EEPROM. This may lead you to wonder, what's the difference between this feedback loop here in blue? and this upper feedback loop in yellow. The major difference is due to the output enable on the chips. On the upper 574, this is connected to clock 2 bar, so the output's only active while clock 2's high. 
The output enable on the lower 574 is connected to reset bar, so this is always driving the wires except during reset. I ignore the output of the EEPROM while clock 2 is high, so conceptually, it's like connecting clock 2 to the output enable of the EEPROM. Normally, when clock 2 is low, the output from the upper 574 is disabled, but the EEPROM and the lower 574 are both enabled. This means some other device on the W bus will be providing the upper address bits back into the EEPROM. When clock 2 goes high, the EEPROM itself will be disabled, but the upper 574 will be driving the W bus. Because the 574 and the EEPROM are never on at the same time, this upper yellow feedback loop never forms. Let's add this W bus connection to the EEPROM onto our schematic diagram. You'll notice that the address lines that I'm using aren't contiguous. I start with A14 and go down to A8, then I use A19 for W7. This might seem a bit unusual, but if you actually look at the layout of the board, this makes most sense. Given the way that I've run the W bus, I want to use the upper eight pins on the right side of the EEPROM. I'm allowed to do this, I just need to make a correction when I program the EEPROM. Finally, I need to add the last one of this set of six Octal D type flip flops. Copy and paste the data inputs, and I just need to make a small correction to the way I've routed the bus. Now we are absolutely cooking with gas here. I just need to add this last little jumper, plug in another 574, and let's see if it works. <laughs> In the most simple terms, a computer can be described as a finite state automata plus a memory system. Well, we've built the finite state automata in this video. Next video will be about the memory system and the thinking and theory behind its architecture. Then in the third video, I'll write the software that goes in the SAP1 ROM and explain in more detail what happens with all the clock cycles. I've also got a little bit of a surprise in store for the end. That's it for now. Comments are welcome, and actually they really help the channel, so does subscribing and liking this video.